Today I'm cooking up a picnic, complete with picnic chicken. That's just chicken that tastes good cold or at room temperature, along with a tortellini salad, complete with cherry tomatoes and some arugula. And last, but definitely not least, a Pim's cup, which if you've never had it, is very refreshing on a hot day. Now to get started, we're gonna focus on the chicken because it takes the longest to prepare. And picnic chicken, well, it means a lot of different things to different people. And this recipe was developed Oh, 15 years ago by a friend and colleague named Sarah. And in fact, whenever we make it, we just call it Sarah's chicken because we make it a lot during the summer. And her challenge was to make a chicken that tasted good straight from the fridge or at room temperature. What Sarah did is she made a spice mixture with a lot of spices and a little brown sugar and then roasts the chicken so that it has a lot of flavor and that little bit of sugar caramelizes. So it has a little bit of crunch even when it's cold. So to get started, we're gonna make the spice rub. And I sugar. We're going to use brown sugar, about three tablespoons of brown sugar. And to get a tablespoon, I'm really just using the bag to help press the brown sugar into the measuring spoon. That way it's a nice packed spoonful. Next step, chili powder. We're going to use two tablespoons of a chili powder. And chili powders are just a mix of spices and herbs, so choose one that you like a lot. This happens to be my favorite. A little paprika, which adds a whole lot of color and a little bit of a sweet flavor. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of paprika. There we go. Next up, salt. We're gonna use kosher salt and two tablespoons of that. The salt plays an important role, not just for flavoring the chicken, but for helping that chicken stay juicy even when it's cold. Some black pepper is next, about two teaspoons of that. Mm. Last but not least, cayenne. Now, how much cayenne you add, it's really up to you. The recipe calls for a range of cayenne. And over the years, I found that backing down on the cayenne, even though I like spicy food, is better because this makes a lot and you're gonna serve a lot of people. And not everybody likes spicy food. All right, so into a bowl this goes. And this is where you gotta use your fingers, get in there and break up that brown sugar and make sure it's evenly distributed. You gotta need a bigger bowl for this than you think. You think you could use a little spice bowl, but you have to have a big enough bowl to get your fingers in there so you don't make too much of a mess. Oh, all right, setting that aside for now. So this recipe calls for five pounds of bone-in chicken, and you can use whatever cut of chicken you like. If you wanna do all breasts, go for it. All drums would be fun, I love the thighs. But it calls for five pounds, and given that it makes so much, I like doing a range of pieces so that everyone gets what they want. And the only thing you really need to do is if you have these split breasts, is cut them in half so they're the similar size of the thighs and the drumsticks. Now I said we have to cut it in half. I don't mean literally in half, because if I did that, you'd have a really dinky piece on this side and a really big piece over here. So I'm gonna cheat it on the thicker side. It's really one third, two thirds. There, it looks good. Right through. And notice I have this handy cutting pad. I love these things, especially if you're just doing a little bit of butchering and you don't want to get your whole board dirty. This is an easy way to keep things clean and sanitary. And then this flat board can just go right into the dishwasher. So a big fan of those. There's the third breast. All right. Now, in terms of prep, the one thing that is really important is we're going to slash the skin in just a couple places. This helps the fat render during roasting so it gets good and crisp. It doesn't get flabby because flabby cold skin on chicken is horrible. So all you do is take a sharp knife, take the very tip. You just want to make one or two slashes through the skin, not through the meat, just through the skin, just like that. And if you see any fatty pockets, like this looks pretty fatty, that's really where you want to focus the knife. All right, and there we go. So now it's time to put the spice rub on the chicken. And notice I'm using a nice deep sheet pan. This is the size of a regular rim sheet pan. But the sides are taller. That just helps contain the mess. And this sheet pan was actually a gift from my dear friend Greer. And it is a lovely gift. All right. So what you wanna do is you wanna sprinkle the spices over it. You wanna peel back the skin on each piece and really get it onto the meat because that's how you're gonna flavor the meat. So every, see it peel back, expose the meat and then put the skin back. And the drumsticks, I just I actually just peel them all back and then sprinkle them. Put 
put the skin back in place. This is pretty much the hardest part of the recipe. It's not hard, it's just a little messy. I kind of think making a mess is fun, so it's all good with me. All right, so now I'm gonna flip them all over, get the back side. Mm -hmm. Spices everywhere. So now I'm gonna start transferring the chicken to a wire rack set over a rimmed baking sheet that's lined with foil. Now this pan over here is actually where we're gonna roast the chicken on. So you're just getting it ready for the oven. All right, so here are the breasts. Now the one thing we found over the years is that the skin on the breast meat tends to shrink in the oven. So one trick that you can do to help it stay in place while you roast it is to pin it in place with toothpicks. I know this is going a bit far, but it doesn't take that much time and it really does help. So just stretching the skin back out over the spices that you rubbed underneath, put some toothpicks in it, and there you go. I also like to put the pieces that have the thin tail part right in the middle where they just get a bit more protected from the oven heat because those are gonna cook through pretty quickly compared to everything else. All right, those are the last pieces of chicken. Put them in the center, put this nice big one on the outside. All right, and that's it for prep. Now the thing is you have to let the chicken sit with those spices for at least six hours. But as I said, I usually do it the day before and just let it sit overnight in the fridge. And we're not gonna cover it in the fridge. You're gonna leave it open. That air dries the skin again so that it renders better and gets more crisp. So I'm gonna get cleaned up, pop this in the fridge. Now it's time to make a Pim's cup. And if you've never had it, it is a lovely, refreshing cocktail, perfect for a hot summer day. Not super strong, and it is officially the cocktail of Wimbledon. So it's very mild-mannered. And it's all based on Pim's, Pim's number one. It has a lovely floral quality. And you mix it with a variety of things to make a Pim's cup. Now, Pim's cup can be made with lots of things. I was first introduced to it, again, by my dear friend Greer, who mixed it with ginger ale, and I love that. Uh, I've also seen it mixed with a lemon lime soda. In New Orleans, they mix it with lemonade and seltzer. But this is more of a classic Pim's cup, and I'm not using any soda. I'm gonna use simple syrup and some fresh lemon juice along with cucumber, which is a traditional flavor. And to get started, we're gonna slice up a cucumber. This is an English cucumber because you have to stay English. And I'm gonna slice it up. Half the slices are going into the drink to help flavor it. The other half are just gonna be garnishes. So I'm just gonna go down and slice this cucumber nice and thin. I washed it, obviously. All right. So half of these will be garnish. Let's see, the first half will be garnish. We'll set those aside for later. And the second half are gonna go right into the pitcher where we're gonna build the Pim's cup. All right, so I'm gonna set this aside. Next up, the lemons. We're gonna use lemon slices and fresh lemon juice. So I'm first gonna slice up a lemon and put that right into the pitcher. There we go. Into the pitcher it goes. Next up, we're gonna make a whole bunch of lemon juice. We're gonna make about nine ounces of lemon juice, which is a cup and two tablespoons to be accurate. Uh, and the recipe I'm using actually was based on 20 ounces of Pims, but a Pims bottle is 26 ounces. And if I'm opening a bottle of Pims, I'm opening a bottle of Pims. So I'm gonna use the whole thing. So I've scaled the recipe up for the whole bottle. All right, so to make a cup of lemon juice, which is a lot, I'm gonna need at least five or six lemons. And of course, if I'm juicing five or six lemons, bringing out the juicer. I only bring this out when I'm making Pim's Cup, margaritas, and lemonade. Well, we're gonna need this last lemon after all. The lemons aren't very juicy. Maybe a few more. All right, that looks pretty good. You see there's a, a little measurement on this side that I'm looking at. And it's just under 10 ounces. I'm looking for nine ounces. So that's right on. All right. 
Gonna add this right to the pitcher, but I'm first gonna strain it just to make sure we caught any of those seeds that might have made their way through. I don't see, oh, there is a seed. I'm just gonna go in and get out those seeds that I don't want. There we go. You. Oh, the rest is good. All right. So that's the lemon juice. Next up, we're gonna add some simple syrup. Need about 10 ounces of simple syrup. This simple syrup, or at least how I make it, is roughly equal parts sugar to water. Some simple syrups are a bit thicker than that, but I like one to one. And that also means you don't have to boil it. I just use boiling water from the kettle and the sugar, and I whisk it together into a bowl until it's dissolved. So it's also a lot easier. So 10 ounces, I'm gonna use a Pyrex here. This Pyrex is pretty old. The numbers are almost gone, but it was my Oma's. And since we're using her cocktail glasses today, nice to pull out the old Pyrex. I can't seem to get rid of it, even though the numbers are nearly gone. There we go, 10 ounces, perfect. I keep this in the fridge almost all summer long. It's just a nice way to make a single glass of iced tea or iced coffee or lemonade. All right, 10 ounces of simple syrup. All right, now we're gonna add some mint, about half a cup of chopped mint. Save some of this mint for a garnish. Pull off the leaves. You want to chop it pretty finely, but you don't want to make grass clippings. Somewhere in the middle of grass clippings, what I call grass clippings, which is an over chopped herb, and our coarse chop. And again, you want about half a cup. All right. Get any of those stems out of there. Sometimes I think the stems taste a bit bitter on mint. So getting any of the stems out, so we just have the leaves, giving it a good chop and this is going to stay in the mixture so you want the pieces to be small enough that they'll fit in the glass you won't a big piece won't land on your tongue but not so small that they really muddy the drink somewhere in the middle all right that's pretty good into the pitcher they go All right, last but definitely not least, the Pims. Mm, the whole bottle. It's a good looking pitcher right here. Right to the top. Ah, oh, et voila. That is how I make a Pims cup. Now the trick is, you have to let this sit for a few hours, at least four hours. Sometimes I even do it a day ahead. And let all those flavors marry, and then when we'll serve it, we'll serve it with club soda to lighten it up a bit. All right. That's the pin scup, gonna pop this in the fridge and next up we can roast the chicken. The chicken is ready for the oven. It's been sitting with the spices for a while. And again, I'm just gonna leave it as it is on the rack, on the sheet pan. I'm gonna make sure there's a little bit of air between each of the pieces. That way the hot air of the oven will more easily get to each piece. And I'm protecting those pointed parts of the breast by putting them in the middle of the sheet pan. Big pieces of breasts on this side, drumsticks on the end. So we're gonna start this at a lower oven temperature, 425 on the middle rack for 15 to 30 minutes, depending on all the variables. And we're gonna roast it until the smallest piece registers 140 degrees. Now that's not cooked yet, but that's gonna be the indicator that it's time to crank the oven to 500, really get a crisp chicken skin and finish cooking the chicken through. And then that finishing time really varies depending on the piece of chicken. So at the very end, I'm gonna be very careful and temp each piece of chicken to take it out of the oven at just the right time because that's how you know your chicken will be juicy when it's cold. All right, so into a 425 degree oven. All right, set the timer because this is not a steel trap anymore. Like it ever was. All right, so while the chicken is in the oven, we're gonna make the tortellini salad, starting with tortellini. So we're gonna use a cheese tortellini, and you need about a pound to make a nice big salad. I found that they now come in 20 ounce packages, which also works here. And I have some water boiling back here. Nice big pot of four quarts of water. I'm gonna add a good amount of salt, about a tablespoon of salt. Cut this package open. And into the hot water it goes. Nice. Now these cook pretty quickly. 
They take about seven minutes and I also always start a timer for those. Yes, my timer can handle two things at once. It's a great timer. All right, give these a stir. So while that tortellini is boiling away, we're gonna make the dressing for the salad. Starting with a small shallot. I'm just gonna mince the shallot up. That way it incorporates really nicely into the dressing. Oh, you know what? I forgot to put the pine nuts on the stove because we're gonna add some toasted pine nuts to this salad, which add a lovely flavor. Um, I, <laughs> I always forget about the pine nuts. So we're gonna toast them in a skillet. You want about a quarter cup of pine nuts. And to toast them, I forget about pine nuts all the time. I especially forget about them when I'm toasting them because they burn like that if you're not watching. And uh, <laughs> the fastest nut in the West to burn. So what I've learned over the years is to put it on a low heat, put it on the front of the burner and just shake them all the time. But the low heat, I can't tell you, has saved me more than once. All right, so pine nuts are toasting. Now we'll return our attention to the shallot. Just going to mince this up nice and fine for a dressing. And to mince a shallot, you really just mince it like an onion, cutting it crosswise and vertically, and then finally going down through the layers to make a nice fine mince. A lot of people I know like to use a smaller knife when mincing a shallot because they just find it's easier to maneuver around a small vegetable. So that's a good tip too if you're having trouble mincing a shallot. Run the knife back through just to make sure all the pieces are nice and finely chopped. All right, I'm gonna build this in the nice big bowl that we're actually gonna keep the salad in. Less dishes to wash. All right, so we're gonna add a little bit of lemon juice, about three tablespoons or so. Pine nuts. They're good because I'm using low heat. <laughs> it's not unusual to hear someone in the kitchen like pine nuts because everyone always burns the pine nuts. And so it's always a good reminder, especially in my kitchen. Pine nuts. All right. Now we're going to add some cherry tomatoes. We're going to add this to the salad early on because we want them to release their juices and help flavor the vinaigrette. You just want to cut these in half and because they're grape tomatoes. Well, let's see. You know, grape tomatoes usually don't work well with my trick, which is for cherry tomatoes, but cutting them in half is a real pain. Let's, let's see. They're a bit big. Taking two lids, putting half the tomatoes on one lid, half on the other side, slicing through. Oh, it works just fine. All right. It's a good trick, huh? Works for grapes and olives too. Sometimes if the grape tomatoes are really elongated, it doesn't work so well. But these are a round group of tomatoes. All right, into the bowl they go. Now I'm gonna add one clove of garlic. I'm gonna use raw garlic here. I like it's a little bit of a sharp bite and we're making so much salad that one clove really isn't a lot. I'm gonna use a rasp grater. I begin because I like how the fine puree of this fresh garlic really works its way into the dressing. Makes it nice and even and there's no big hits of garlic that'll hit your tongue. A little goes a long way when you're adding pureed garlic because the more you chop garlic, the more garlic flavor you release. So when you're using pureed, just use a small amount. I'm gonna add some salt and pepper. Pretty obvious. I'm going to add some olive oil, about six tablespoons or thereabouts of olive oil, also known as a good glug. That looks good. Last but not least, some basil. Uh, I'm going to add a hefty amount of basil, about half a cup chopped thereabouts. I overdo it on the basil because I like basil. If you're going to do basil, do basil. I'm going to give this a rough chop. I like big pieces of basil in the salad. So it doesn't need to be too fine. All right, that looks pretty good. Add that in there. Mm -hmm. Add it all in there. 
it's way more than half a cup, but I don't care. I like a basil-y pasta salad. That tortellini should be done cooking. Mm. Pine nuts. Oh, ho, 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 ho. that got close. You can see some of them are a little on the toasty side. I actually don't mind the little toasty ones. They're a little bit sort of dark on the darker side. It tastes like popcorn. The rest of them look pretty good. So I might have to pick through <laughs> and pick out some of the darker ones. Woo! All right, into a bowl these go. Every time. Pine nuts are my nemesis. All right, pine nuts are off. All right, so into the dressing, the hot tortellini goes. Now, I've seen a lot of recipes that rinse the tortellini with cool water before adding it to the vinaigrette. Adding the tortellini to the dressing while it's hot really just helps it absorb all those flavors. And adding the basil in there too, the warmth brings out the fragrance of the basil and starts to wilt those cherry tomatoes ever so slightly. So in the end, it's a, a slightly softer cherry tomato, but they've released all their juices into the vinaigrette. All right, oh, this is one of my favorite salads. That's it for this pasta salad. We're gonna add the pine nuts and some Parmesan and then arugula just before serving. But this we're gonna put in through the refrigerator to chill down. So while this salad is chilling in the refrigerator, I'm gonna keep my attention on that chicken because we're gonna crank up that oven to 500 degrees just for the last 10 or 15 minutes of cooking. And of course, I'm gonna temp each piece of chicken and take it out of the oven right when it's perfectly done. So everything's all done. The chicken has been taken out of the oven. And again, I took each piece out just as it finished cooking. And for white meat, that's 160 degrees. For dark meat, however, it's higher. It's 175 degrees. So each piece came out just as it's finished cooking. And then you let it rest to room temperature. And you can refrigerate this for up to a day. But eating at room temperature is perfect. So of course, you have to remove the toothpicks because no one wants to eat a toothpick. I know, we've all done it, right? Usually on salt and boca, oh, it's the worst. But it did its job really well. It held that chicken skin in place as the chicken cooked so you get it nice and rendered. All right, so this chicken is ready for the platter. Now, when it comes to serving this chicken, because this is enough for a crowd, I'm gonna gussy up the plate a little bit, which is not my usual go-to. I usually don't gussy, but for this sort of thing, I'm all in. And I'm using this curly leaf kale. <laughs> <laughs> which will make a lot of people laugh if you've ever worked in a kitchen. This is your basic garnish. You put it on every platter ever known. All right, so what you wanna do is make sure the curly parts of the kale are just hanging over the edge of the dish. And then I rip off the stems because they tend to get in the way, but I put them down in the middle because it acts like a nice bed that the chicken can rest on. It makes it a little higher, makes it look taller. So that, <laughs> That's how you decorate a platter with kale. I know, my culinary friends are laughing at me right now. All right, so onto the platter the chicken goes. Oh, I love those charred bits where the sugar really caramelized because that makes the chicken taste like it came off the grill. Oh, such good chicken. So there is a nice platter of chicken. Now we're gonna finish the tortellini salad. To finish it off, we're gonna add the pine nuts I toasted. Now we're also gonna add some Parmesan. I'm gonna grate the Parmesan right into the bowl. You want about half a cup, but I'm using the large holes on this box grater. So I like nice big shreds of Parmesan in the salad. That looks pretty good. Last but not least, a little bit of arugula. I'm gonna use baby arugula here because you don't need to chop it. I only want about a cup or two. Just gonna rip it up with my hands, add it to the bowl. Adding it at the end after the salad is chilled is important or else that arugula will wilt and look like it sat in a hot car and you don't want that. I'm gonna mix this all together in this work bowl, but then I'm gonna put it in a nice pretty bowl for serving because you know I put kale on the platter, I might as well use a clean bowl for the salad. All right. Oh yeah, I'm also gonna season it with just a little bit of salt and pepper. Now that I have the salad divided into two bowls, it's a little easier to mix. Pepper, little pepper. Okay, oh yeah. All right, that looks good. 
Let us not forget about the pims, <laughs> which I have all ready to go on my grandmother's tray. So to make an actual pims cocktail, you can do it in the pitcher and just serve out of the pitcher, but I like to make each pims by the glass. These are my grandmother's glasses. I grew up drinking milk out of these, and I love that they're still around for cocktails. Now put some ice into a cup. Gonna put some of the pims mixture. And now how much seltzer you had, well, that's up to you. If you want a strong PIMS or a weaker PIMS, there's no right or wrong answer here. Just want to use plain seltzer. Oh yeah, that's perfect. And the garnishes for a PIMS cup are all over the place. Lemon, cucumber, and strawberry is also a traditional garnish on a PIMS cup, but that just looks so nice and summery, of course. A little sprig of mint on the top. That is a good Pim's cup. Ah, oh, perfect. Now time to make myself a little tasting plate. So to start off with some of the salad. The salad brings the house down every time I make it. Nice piece of chicken. I always go for the thighs. I also always go for the piece that has a little bit of that char on the outside because I love that flavor. It really tastes like summer on the grill, even though we did it in the oven. Hmm, oh, kitchen picnic. Think summery thoughts and <laughs> enjoy the picnic food. Mm-hmm. The tortellini salad is so simple, so good. Just with fresh lemon juice, that little bit of arugula, all that basil, makes it taste like summer. Now for the real summer treat, the picnic chicken. Mm. Mmm, it has so much flavor. All those spices really make it taste grilled in a way. And it's juicy. That's because we let it sit overnight with all that salt. Oh, that in a Pim's cup. Mmm, oh, these flavors, I love them together. This is the perfect summer picnic. See you next time. Mm. Thanks for watching. What'd you think? Leave a comment below and let me know what you're excited to cook this week. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. You can get today's recipes and more for free at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash julia at home.